Welcome to our show tonight, Polygamy, What Love Is This? I'm your host, Doris Hansen, and we are broadcasting live from Salt Lake City, Utah. This is a live telephone call-in program. We would like to hear from our viewers when we open up the telephone line, and we especially would like to hear from our polygamous viewers. We do know that uh, sometimes it's a little bit... Um, scary for a, somebody in a polygamous group to reach to some outside uh, source and talk or or uh, explain things but uh, you can always call in with an alias or just say you want to remain anonymous but we would like to hear uh, your remarks and and your responses to uh, the content that we have on the show of course we do invite all of our viewers you're all important to us our telephone number is 801-973-TV20 801-973-8820. Uh, our email address is tv at aboutpolygamy.com and we do invite your emails as well. We'd like to hear your responses to the show. Uh, if you have any private information that you'd like to tell us about or anything in the future you'd like us to focus on in particular, uh, please email us at tv at aboutpolygamy.com. And the webpage for the show is www.whatloveisthis.tv what love is this dot tv and you can go there and watch uh, previous programs on streaming video there's a question and answers page that you can go on and also uh, just little tidbits about the show that might be of interest to you for more information about our helps ministry to uh, the polygamous people you can go on to our web page shield and refuge dot org when i was uh, 18 years old. I had been raised in a polygamy group and when I was 18 I packed a bag and I ran away in the middle of the night and when I ran away I didn't know where I was going and I didn't know what I was doing and I jumped from the frying pan into the fire and if I had had or had known of a ministry that was out there that was willing to reach out and help people running from polygamy my life would have been a whole bunch different. Um, if I had known from the beginning that polygamy wasn't something that God required, my life would have been much different uh, from the beginning. And that's what we want to do at Shielded Refuge. We want you to know that you don't have to jump from the firing pan to the fire. We're here to help you. Uh, the word shield and refuge comes from we want to shield you from people who would pursue you if you leave the group. We want to offer you a refuge. We want to offer you love. We want to offer you information so that you will know that God does not require this for your salvation. You don't have to practice polygamy to please Him. And you don't have to run uh, for the rest of your life after you leave a polygamy group thinking that you have left your only chance of salvation. So you can go onto our webpage and find information like this. Uh, please write down our toll-free number for, excuse me, for any help that you might need at any time, now or in the future. You might want to give this number to someone that you think might need help as well. Or if you or someone that you know is in a polygamy group and you're being forced into something that you don't want to do or you're uncomfortable with, you can always, of course, call 911 for an emergency, but please write down our toll-free number and have it handy. It's 877-425-9993. We have a monthly discussion group that we hold in the Salt Lake area. We have it the third Monday of each month. You're invited to join it. It's a supportive, uh, non-confrontational. It's also confidential. And if you would like to join that group, you're welcome to do that. Just email us, tv at aboutpolygamy.com for the details. We also have an online support group. Uh, which you, we uh, invite you to join that as well. And for details, please email us at tv at aboutpolygamy.com. Anyone who is in a polygamy group right now, or maybe you've left a polygamy group and you just still have questions and issues that, that you just kind of want to deal with, we have a DVD uh, entitled Lifting the Veil of Polygamy. We would like to send that to you free of charge, but we do need to, ha to have your contact information on where to send it. So if you call, you can call tonight and request it. You can email us, tv at aboutpolygamy.com. But just let us know where we can send the DVD and we'll send it to you absolutely free. And please know also that the information that you give us will be used only to send you the DVD. We will not use it for anything else. Um, in March of 1842, a letter was published 
in the Times and Seasons, written by Joseph Smith, to John Wentworth, editor of the Chicago Democrat. In that letter, Joseph Smith explained his doubts about joining any Christian church. And when Joseph Smith was only 14 years old, he claimed that each church that he had investigated uh, pointed to their own particular creed as being the perfect one. Smith said that not all churches could be right, and that since God was not a God of confusion, he was going to investigate this just a little bit more fully to find out what was going on. He went on to say, and I quote, If God had a church, it would not be split into factions. Joseph Smith said that if God had a church, it would not be split into factions. Now, this is an extremely interesting remark made from the founder of a church that has thus far been factioned into over 200 uh, offshoots. I have a book here. It's called The Divergent Paths of the Restoration. This book was written by Stephen L. Shields. He was a student at Brigham Young University. And in this book, I have counted at least 232 different churches listed as breakoff groups from the mainline Mormon church since the beginning. Now, let's just round this off to say 200, just so that we don't be accused of being exaggerating here. And so we have at least 200 churches listed as being a breakoff. Now, that's more than 200 breakoffs in just over 175 years. And Joseph Smith said God's true church would not be split into factions. Now, unlike Christian churches, most of these Mormon splinter groups will have nothing to do with each other because they each believe that they are the only true church. They believe that they are the only one that have the keys to God's kingdom and they believe that they are the only one that has God's authority on this earth. And of course, this is modeling their leader, Joseph Smith. Christianity does not do that. Christianity actually knows that the only things that we can trust on this earth is Jesus Christ and the Bible. True Christian denominations do not follow groups or group leaders. So doesn't it seem rather strange to you that the very thing that Smith was complaining about the Christian denominations is what actually happened to the church that he established? I'd like to ask our viewers who are members of any of these offshoot groups, how do you know you're in the right one? How do you know your church is right? We've got over 200 here, all from Joseph Smith. Now, most of these groups hold to some aspect of the Mormon doctrine. Some reject some parts of it and accept other parts of it. Some maintain the basic Mormon origins and then will just kind of put their little spin on it. Most of them have come up with their own personal revelation and they've added it to the already revelation, again modeling their leader, Joseph Smith. And then there's uh, those like the Mormon fundamentalists who hold on to the original doctrine as invented by George Joseph Smith in the beginning. In fact, the polygamy groups could claim that it's the mainline church that's gone apostate since they have given up what the original leadership claimed was a cornerstone of salvation, and that's polygamy. So how do you know your church is correct? Those who claim to be the only true church cannot be the only true church if they deny that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh, if they uh, deny that there's only one true God, and if they believe that man can become a God, those who reject salvation by grace and depend upon a salvation by works cannot be the only true church. And those who deny that the Bible is God's only word to mankind. Now, these are uh, doctrines I just mentioned are solid biblical doctrines that cannot be compromised. But they are rejected by most of the groups in this book. In this book, we find information about a particular group called the Order of Aaron. And we're going to focus 
on the order of Aaron tonight with tonight's guest. So I thought uh, perhaps I would just give a little bit of information about that from this book so that you'd be familiar uh, with the United or with the Order of Aaron. The founder of uh, this group is Maurice Glendenning. He descended from an old Scottish family and he claims that um, Levitical blessings were passed down into his family from generation to generation. And these blessings, as well as other teachings, have been recorded by Glenn Denning in his writing, again modeling his leader, Joseph Smith, and they are called the Leviticus or the Levitical writings. Maurice began hearing music and later a voice directing him to write down things that only he could hear. At 14 years old, I find that an interesting age, he began writing poems which were far advanced for someone his age according to the people around him. And he eventually wrote a book of messages called the Book of Elias. Maurice was a chiropractor. He married and settled down in Provo. He and his wife were baptized and joined the Mormon Church in 1929. When the Mormon church rejected his writings, Glenn, Dan Glenn Denning started his own group and um, the, his first converts to the group, of course, were former members of the Mormon church. They founded several communities and the primary one is in Eskdale, Utah. These communities were quiet and they don't recruit people because they believe God is going to bring in the members that he wants to them, the converts that he wants them to have. Glenn Denning died in 1969 and left no successor, no named successor or leader. Now this group also uses other names and I don't know if these will be familiar to anyone but I thought I would bring these names out. Besides the Order of Aaron, they also go by the Aaronic Order, the House of Aaron, the House of Levi, the True Church of God, the Church of the Firstborn, Kingdom of God, the Church of Christ and so on. Their hierarchy is Jesus Christ is the great high priest. Then they have the president who is the chief high priest. And then they have a first high priest. And then they have a second, well, they have several second high priests. And then they have the 12 counselors. And that's the way their church is established. At the beginning of their group, they uh, used Sunday, uh, celebrated the, their uh, day of worship on Sunday. But then they changed that to Saturday, which is the true uh, biblical Sabbath. If anyone's uh, worshiping on the Sabbath day and they call it Sunday, you got it wrong because the Sabbath day is on a Saturday. For scriptures, they use the Bible. They use parts of the Book of Mormon. They use some of the Doctrine and Covenants, the Dead Sea Scrolls. And then, of course, they use Glenn Denning's own writings, true to form to his leader, Joseph Smith. And the name of his writings are the Book of Elias, the Book of the New Revelations, and the Discipleship Book. They also have a periodical entitled Aaron's Star. Now nothing is mentioned here about their practice of polygamy. But then like Joseph Smith, many of these groups kept polygamy extremely high secret. And which is probably the case with this one as well. But tonight our guest uh, is going to share with us uh, his grandfather his experiences with the Order of Aaron when he uh, practiced polygamy in this group. So I'd like to welcome to our show tonight, Russ East. Thanks for coming. It's great to be here. Thanks for being here and being willing to share. Sure. Okay. Uh, before we get started on interviewing and, and asking your questions about your father, your grandfather's experiences with polygamy, would you care to tell our viewers a little bit about yourself? Well, I was born into a fourth generation Mormon home. My mother grew up in the Provo area, the Orem area, and I was um, saved at the age of 14. And I started going on mission trips to Utah and um, loved Utah. Came out for a month when I was 19 and felt a real calling to come here and do ministry. And uh, a few years later, met my wife in college and we moved to Utah in 94. And uh, we've, we've tried to do as much ministry as we can to, to lovingly reach out to Utah, the people here for Christ. Mm -hmm. And so presently, um, we're involved with AM820, Christian Radio, mm -hmm. and Utah Partnerships for Christ also, mm -hmm. where we bring out mission teams. And we've done uh, work with you in the past, and we've mm -hmm. been blessed by it just to mm -hmm. try and encourage you and help 
help young people, high school, college students, to learn more about how they can be involved in your ministry and uh, reach, reach the LDS people here in Utah. Mm -hmm. With the truth of the biblical Jesus, right. the biblical salvation. Right. Now, you, were you born in Provo, did you say? I was born in Northern California, but, but my mother was born in the Provo oh, area. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. grew up there in Provo. Yeah. And then she moved to California, and that's where you were born. Right. Okay, right. okay. Just make sure I have my facts straight here. Okay, well, let's talk about your family connection to polygamy. I was... Uh, uh, quite surprised when uh, actually I was speaking to a group of your of your uh, students that came out and you mm -hmm. mentioned that you had polygamy in your background and I was quite shocked uh, mm -hmm. because you hadn't said that before. So would you explain the connection that your family has with polygamy? Well, my uh, my mother growing up as a a, a Mormon boy, um, it was talked about very little, but yet when it was about about my grandfather, my mom's dad. It was always a very dark subject. It was always a subject of fear and of, of pain and of hurtfulness. Uh, I never had a relationship really with my grandfather. I, I met him twice, three times in my, in my life. I hmm. interacted with him very little. Mm -hmm. I did learn, though, that he left my grandmother and six kids in Utah to join up with a polygamous group. Mm -hmm. And so, th having said that, it was, it was mysterious, it was odd, thinking about your grandpa on, on my mom's side being all tangled up in this type of a lifestyle. Mm -hmm. It was the type of thing where I would ask a few questions, but it was, it was not until I was about oh, 15 or so when I came to Utah on a mission trip with my church. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was a, a small, like a youth choir, you know, we'd sing in churches and we sang at Kaysville Bible Church, I remember, and he was there. And so uh -huh. that was great. He did hear the gospel presented uh -huh. Uh -huh. and he brought one of his wives to that, to that church. Okay, so when, now when he left, you, were you born yet? No, when, no. When he left, and he had a family of six. Right, and it, right. And he left your grandma. Right, right. And he, he took off. Do, do you know if he was recruited? Do you know how they found him to, what, how he happened I, to find out about him? I don't know how that happened, but I do know that he did get the family out to California and got them out there to California in the Bay Area, got them kind of settled, and then... Then he said goodbye and went back to Utah. Oh my goodness! So he did move everybody out there to sort of separate, you know, make a real separation, you know. And then I don't even know if he had had children through the two wives that he married up with. Mm -hmm. but so he married two wives. Two, yeah. Well, what did your grandma? I mean, how was she taking all this? She, how old were the children that he lived oh, her with? Oh, anywhere from about maybe oh 16, 17 down to maybe. Two or three, Young and kids. and one one child was um, uh, had uh, special needs, you know, was uh -huh. mentally retarded, I think, you know, uh -huh. and so really and left my grandmother in a lurch, you know, wow. um, having to raise all those kids, and Did she he was provide anything for them. I don't think very much, if any, and oh my my, my grandmother worked a lot. Um, she later remarried uh, to a great guy, and so he was my step grandfather, and. He had nothing to do with polygamy or, or even anything to do with the LDS church. He was a Christian man, mm -hmm. uh, actually. But mm -hmm. uh, So your grandma must have been devastated. W yeah. did, was it a shock? Did she expect something like this, do you know? Or has that been yeah, shrouded it, in secrecy? It's, it's all been shrouded in, in, in secrecy and, and quietness. But and she wouldn't really ever talk about it. It was all just something of the past. I mean, it was so so hurtful and painful. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm sure to some degree you have to move on and go forward. Right, but, um, right. But wow. it was always a, a very black eye, a dark part you, of You don't know then if your, if your grandfather maybe heard about the group and the polygamy and, and was drawn to it and maybe asked your grandma to join and she said no. Do you, do you know if that's a possibility? Yeah, I don't know. Um, but I do know, of course, about a situation about my mother. Uh-huh. You know, we can and, talk and about your that. Mother, so how old was your mother when this happened? Oh, she was about maybe 16, something like that. So she was one of the older kids. Right, right. Yeah. I see. Okay. Uh, did your, so your grandma divorced grandpa then and, and remarried right. and, and to a Christian man. Okay. Right. Do you know if your grandpa tried to recruit any of his children or any other for family member into the polygamy group? Yeah, well, this is like the most scary thing, I think, about the whole thing. And I don't know about the rest of my aunts and uncles. 
um, my mom's brothers and sisters, but I do know that my grandfather told my mom when she came, she came back to Utah actually to go to BYU. And so she was 19 years old and she was enjoying her first uh, freshman uh, year at BYU. But uh, her, her father introduced her to the leader of, the, of this polygamous sect, this group, mm -hmm. and said that uh, if you would like to join up with this group, they will take care of you forever. And he encouraged her to do it. And he was really trying hard to get her into this group. She'd be married off to an older man, maybe 65, 70 years old, oh. along with other, other women, other young girls. Uh -huh. But here was the catch. If she joined up with it, she, she didn't have to. He wasn't going to force her. Yeah. But if she did join up with it and then later on decided to leave, he came out and told her point blank that the group would seek after her life and kill her if she left it. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And having heard that, uh, she, my mom has told me that she was so unnerved by that whole experience, yeah, you can imagine. Uh -huh. And uh, I guess like lots of her hair came out of her head, you know, just yeah, nerves and, and just, just fell apart. And she just freaked out and just, she, she, she dropped her college career in, in Utah. She went back to California. Wow. And you can imagine how estranged her relationship was with her own father. Oh, I can imagine. So yeah. it's, it's a, So he it, wasn't trying to um, to pressure her into doing it, but just kind of laid it on the line that that's. Yeah, I think you know? he, I think he tried to show it as a as a positive thing, as something he thought would be great and wonderful. And so at least he was, at least he was, <laughs> in a sense, open enough to say, you know, if you leave it. You know, you you will be hunted down and you will be killed. Oh, no, no bones about it. That's awful. Yeah, I can, I can, I would, I would drop it, and run too, if I was yeah. your mother. <laughs> so, how did, how does your mother uh, treat this whole idea today? Does she talk about it much, or is it kind it's, of? It's it's so painful. It's so so agonizing. She's even still today, after how many years, you know. Um, he passed away about 25 years ago, uh -huh. and she will not really talk about it today. It's oh. just one of those topics that hmm. would rather not. It brings up too much, too much How pain for the past. How does she react when polygamy stories come out, like the FLDS stories? And that? does she show reaction to those? I believe so, to some degree. Um, it's again uh, painful, and so you'd almost like to just turn it off and just not even yeah. acknowledge it, and yeah. and just. Uh, I'm sure. Wow. Uh, so your mother wasn't the oldest child, but she was close to being the I, oldest? I think she's the second oldest. The second oldest, yeah. okay. Um, you don't know if he got to try to get any of the other children to join? Yeah, that I don't know. I don't know about that. But I do know, sadly, that he ended up just moving out to Moab from the Provo area, and he died uh, very much estranged and alone from all of his sons and daughters and... Um, he did try five years before he died. He, I guess he knew he had cancer. So uh, about five years before he died, he came out with one of his wives to California to try to make amends with everybody. But you oh. can imagine, mm. you know, there had been so much damage done. Mm -hmm. It was very difficult for any of the kids and the family and the grandkids to embrace him as, sure. as great loving grandfather. Especially bringing one of his wives. Yeah, bring one of his wives along, right. So I remember he, that day, right before Christmas he came. Yeah. He had two wives, did he have two wives, any more than that that you know? No, I think it's just two. Two wives. Mm -hmm. Were they very much younger or older than him, do you know? About the same age, oh, about the same age as him. Yeah. And do you know about children? Did he have any children with them? I don't the, think so, I never heard about that. I think I would have heard about that, so I'm gonna say he didn't have any more children. That's interesting. Yeah. The purpose of polygamy mm -hmm. is supposed to be to have children. Mm. Now that's interesting that, that he wouldn't have any children. Mm. Um, do you happen to know if this group lived the united order to where they require new members to uh, sign all their property, all of their worldly material goods over to them? Do you happen to know if he was involved You know, in that? I remember hearing that just the fact that he was, he, he didn't have a lot of belongings. You know, he wasn't a man with very much wealth or anything. So as I think about it, I don't know for sure, but I, I, I would say he didn't have much materially speaking. No property. Or... Not a lot to show for or anything. Just very, mm -hmm. very, very meager. So. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. 
Interesting, because I know that the, this book says that they do require the property to be signed over to them. Mm. Uh, if for, and in fact, what, that's one of the stages of obtaining membership is to, and that's normal for a united order mm. to, for, to require the members, all of their personal property is to be signed mm. over them, which again is an, uh, nothing that God requires. So your grandpa lived, how many years was it uh, after he uh, went to California, met brought his wife and then came back here and then he died. How many years were Oh, probably around, uh, let's see, 60, maybe 25 years. Oh. Mm -hmm. So if there had been any children, I mean, you... I would have you, known. You I would think. have known about yeah. that. Yeah. Okay. Do you know if your grandfather left any journals, personal journals or diaries or any information about his personal life in the group or otherwise? He really seemed to cut off the relationships, which is so sad. And I don't know if that has if that's a common thread with a, a polygamous lifestyle where you just, when you leave your, your current wife, if she doesn't want to be involved in it, I guess, I guess they just cut ties and so. I, uh, I spoke with a gentleman, well, I've spoken with him several times, many, many times in the past uh, couple of years, year and a half, couple of years. His wife did that to him. Hmm. And uh, they had uh, four or five young children. Well, different ages and she just left him and to join a polygamy group and it just broke his heart it mm. absolutely totally devastated him but she did that she just cut completely cut mm. off the relationship but he had a right to see his children and so he he you know pursued that pursued his rights and every time he would meet up with her he, he would say uh, I don't know her She's different. She's, mm -hmm. It's like she's a whole different person. Yeah, yeah. I don't know who she is. And, you know, I was just thinking how it's great that in Christ, you know, having been born again myself and being rescued out of the whole mainstream Mormon life, lifestyle and family and everything, just to think that God can use people like, you know, me in spite of myself and my grandfather's background and everything yeah. to try and do what I can to reverse yeah. the pain and the... Uh, and the type of life that he, he, the legacy he left, which was a bad one, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and it's, it's troubling, it's disturbing. So maybe there's, maybe there's a, uh, a viewer out there who is like me and, and they have a grandfather or a, or a father, you know, that or was, a loved one of yeah, some sort it's, it's, it's a, that. it's a really awkward, very, very, uh, troubling kind of a thing. You have to give it over to God constantly because mm -hmm. it's part of your heritage. It's part of, mm -hmm. you know, and, and you're ashamed of it. Mm -hmm. I think, I think that's the thing about me. So not that I do what I do now in ministry because I'm so completely just so ashamed of my past. Or not my past, but it's my family's yours, past. Right. Yeah, yeah it's just, you have to differentiate it, you mm -hmm. know, and, and just say, okay, well, this is who, this is, this, who this is my life and this is where God has called me is into Utah. Mm -hmm. And it, I'll tell you what, it's, as I've learned more about your ministry, it's, it's, it is a very frightening thing when you hear about the retribution that some people do, but fear is always something that Satan wants to use. Mm -hmm. And, and the, you know, many polygamy groups do use that fear. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm glad your grandpa told your mother right. uh, that, that there's that possibility. Hopefully she wouldn't have gone into polygamy anyway, right. but, but at least the truth was out and it was there. Mm -hmm. And they do, they use fear. I, I grew up on fear. I, I knew fear every day of my life and it mm -hmm. isn't, it isn't, um, uh, easy to shake. Uh, we're, we are um, not quite done with the interview yet, but if you want to start calling in, you're certainly welcome to. Our telephone number is 801-973-8820. You can start calling in. Our operators will start screening the calls and we will uh, take your questions or comments about uh, polygamy tonight. So you did meet your grandfather personally yeah. Uh, the 15 years old when you were singing. And I also remember too when I was really young, maybe five or six years old, just, you know, those little memories when you're a child, you, you think back. I remember um, my family, but for some reason, we went back to visit my my great-grandmother when she was really up in years, close to 90 years old. Mm. And so I can remember her giving me candy and sitting on her lap, you know, and then we went to go visit my grandfather. I remember us going in some store, you know, and and going around in some cart, you know, just small little glimpses of him. I remember him being a, you know, somewhat of a just, he was kind and everything, but it wasn't close or anything. It didn't, and there was tension. And my, my mom was always, I remember her telling me that she would always be with me mm -hmm. when he was around. She never would let me go off with him, you know, by mm -hmm. myself. Totally mistrusting. Right. And then when I was 15, 
something. I remember seeing in that church and look, uh, looking down and seeing him listening and, you know, and it was, it was. Did, did you know it was, you knew it was him? Oh yeah, he, yeah. He, he came he and he gave me some type of a, I remember he gave me some type of a tie tack pin or something like that, you know, mm -hmm. some type of a jewelry type of thing for your tie or something like mm -hmm. that. And just came up and gave me a hug, you know, and. Did he try and, to make uh, amends in any way that you know of to your mother or to you or to your grandmother? Not really. Just, I think he told me that he loved me or something like that, you know. And uh, no indication yeah. of his sorrow that no. he did so. He, he no, was, none of that. He was none a convert that. then, wasn't he? And then he? I just saw him right before Christmas, about five years before he died, around 1982, maybe something like that. 1982 is when he died. Yeah. And you were how old then? Oh, I was around uh, let's see, 16, 17. Did and he you, died five years later. Did you understand? Um, um, what had happened when you got older like that? Did you understand what had happened with him? And, and at that time, did you understand polygamy and Mormonism, early Mormonism? Uh, beginning to. Um, having gone on a couple of mission trips to Utah and, and studying a lot myself, I, I don't know, I didn't know as much as I do now, of course, but, sure, yeah. but, I, but I was starting to understand the hideousness of it all and just the, the defilement of it all, the betrayal of it all, the, mm -hmm. the uh, ugliness of it all. And mm -hmm. so... Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. Very troubling. Yeah. Um, so you were raised in a Christian environment then? Well, I got saved. I was born into a fourth generation Mormon home, and I was saved when I was 14. We, we went and visited a Christian church when I was 14. Actually, when I was 14, I went into the back woods of our home and I knelt down like Joseph Smith did. So I thought it was great that he had a vision and everything. So I thought, why couldn't I too? Yeah. And nothing happened though. But a neighbor down the street invited us to church. And so God heard my cry when I was 14 that I, was wanted, I wanted to know who God was. And so uh, a pastor um, in California, Santa Rosa, California, he presented the gospel and the Lord touched my heart. And I got saved when I was 14 and just felt like God wanted me to come out to Utah, you know, eventually. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, um, does your, and does your mom still, does she live in Utah or is she in California? They, they, they were in Utah for a little while and they've, they moved back to California. Does she feel yeah. safer there? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I, yeah. <laughs> but there, there is a lot of fear even today about, you know, her um, giving me information about the past and everything. Mm -hmm. And there's lots of fear that's still there mm -hmm. and wanting to distance herself from it and everything. It makes so you wonder understand. if there was more to it than what you know, that the fear would be that. That long term. Yeah. Um, do you know, um, you probably don't know this, but I'm going to ask you anyway, if, if your grandpa picked his, those two wives for himself or were they given to him, you know, as, for, by the leadership? Yeah, I don't, don't know. know I don't know how that, that all worked out. And, but, I, but I do remember just something about one of the wives. They were dressed very much like, like in the beginning of your show, that traditional types of, like in Colorado City, mm -hmm. you know, that kind of When they went out to dress. California, that's the way they she yeah, was dressed. Yeah, right, right. And I remember in Kaysville, very plain clothes, type of a mm -hmm. Little House on the Prairie kind of a look, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, so I, I do remember that. Yeah. You know? Some polygamy groups wear those kinds of clothes, and some don't. Some right. will just dress the normal way. Right. Okay. Um, we, it looks like we have a call come coming in now and we do invite your phone calls if you want to call in 801-973-8820. Uh, Russ, uh, do you uh, do you know, you don't know then if your grandpa ever regretted making this choice and and based on all this information and, and your touch, small touch with, with the life of polygamy, do you think that polygamy should be made legal or not, and why, whatever your answer is. No, I don't think it should be made legal because, it, well, it goes against all of God's principles in Genesis chapter 1, and, you know, God, God would have created Adam and Eve and a few other females, you know, to make Adam complete. Uh, that just doesn't fit with mm -hmm. what, it doesn't match up with what God ordained. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, New Testament, you know, about being an elder in a church, being a one woman, woman man and everything. And mm -hmm. I mean, the whole idea of adultery and betrayal and, you know, all those things, that that is not something that I think our country should legalize. Yeah. That would just create more pain and more chaos and, and uh, mistrust and everything. Yeah. It's funny, uh, Joseph Smith said in, in the quote that I had mentioned that, uh, if God had a church, he wouldn't allow it to be split into factions, and yet he would allow marriage to be split into factions. Mm. The very thing that he... 
Right, and also a sad thing about Joseph Smith, I think, is that he would always prop, uh, uh, propagate the idea that one God is not enough, yeah. one Bible is not enough, and one wife one is not enough. One wife is not enough. Interesting thoughts. I hadn't thought of that before. <laughs> okay, let's take our phone call from Jane in Provo. Hello, Jane. Yes. Yes, you're on the air. Okay. Uh, I would like to uh, clarify a couple of things. I'm Jane and from Provo, and I have lived in um, Utah for 60 years, and I have been a member of the House of Aaron, uh, Ronnie Gorder, and I was wondering if this is who this fellow is talking about, if he is talking about our group, or is he talking about a different... I, I so you're a, you're a member of the House of Aaron? Uh-huh. Well, you know, according to what this book says, according to the names, it's uh -huh. possible that it could be your, the group you're in or it could be another group because there, there's different names applied to different groups. Um, the, or the same names applied to different groups, I should say. Okay. So I don't know if it's yours or not. Does your group practice polygamy? No, well, I got several calls from people that that had heard the first part of your uh, conversation there. And this is, our group is a group that was started by Marie Glendinney. Uh -huh. And it was, um, it is called the House of Aaron. We do have the Levitical writings, but we are not polygamous. Uh -huh. Absolutely not. We teach against polygamy. I can prove that. And we have never been polygamous. I don't know what book you're talking about. We do not have the uh, um, Book of Mormon, we don't have the Doctrine and Covenants. Is that right? Yeah. That's not even what the book says, the, the book well, that I mentioned here. Uh, what book are you talking about? It's the Divergent Paths of the Restoration. Okay, and I it, don't know who uh, wrote the book or anything. I've been a member, I've lived at SDL, I have the Levitical writings, and I don't know who wrote that book, but we are not polygamists. Okay. Polygamy is a Mormon doctrine, and uh -huh. we have nothing to do with Mormon doctrine. Well, it's interesting to, to hear this information, uh, but then again, I'm, I'm, I need to remind you and also our viewers here uh -huh. that there are so many groups that get started and they use so many different names. Even one of the names that's mentioned in here for the Church of the Firstborn is also applied to the LeBaron's group named the Church of the Firstborn, and they right. they, they, they don't touch it even close, so okay. they just we use different names. nothing to do with any of those groups. And our community is totally open. You are welcome to come out. He is welcome to come out. I was out there this week, very weekend, for a funeral. We have a public school there. Uh, anybody is welcome anytime. Mm -hmm. But I'd just like to clarify that we are not polygamous. Mm -hmm. We have never been polygamous. Mm -hmm. And we are told or accused many, many times in SDL of being polygamous and and we're not, and we would like to invite anybody out to our community mm -hmm. anytime. Mm -hmm. They're welcome to come and and realize who we are. We, we love music, we love education, okay. but we are open, like I say, to anybody anytime, but we are not polygamous. Well, thank you, Jane. I appreciate your phone call. It must have been another House of Aaron that his grandfather joined then, but we do appreciate your call it must and, be because and the information. There's never been any polygamy in our group. Uh -huh. In our own writings, in our own books, in the Levitical writings, it teaches against polygamy. Okay. And I just wanted to straighten that out. Mm -hmm. But anyone's welcome. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. He's welcome to go to the group anytime and you will see that we're not polygamous. Okay. Well, thank you, Jane, for calling. Mm, thank you. Uh -huh. Bye. Bye. Okay. So um, the, the House of Aaron that your grandfather joined obviously isn't the house of Aaron that Jane belongs to. Okay. But then again, like I said when I brought this book, there are so many overlapping names mm -hmm. and groups with, with sometimes with so many names that the same or close names or whatever. Right. Uh, it easily, it's an easy mistake to make when one group will go fight by different names anyway. So um, we, we have to know that it's not the group we were at first thinking it was. Uh, now, Let's talk a little bit about um, last summer we had, you and I had the opportunity to help 
a woman that uh, was wanting to leave a polygamous situation. And actually, it took us by surprise. I mean, we were planning it. We were talking about it. The plans were in the main, but it took us by surprise how it happened. Mm -hmm. um, and we can't give out details, of course. Mm -hmm. It's private, confidential. And we can't give out the name of the group or, or any of that or even when it happened. But uh, what I would like you to do is, is after watching this woman and talking with her, getting to know her just a little bit, what give us your heart's uh, response okay, to what you've... Okay, sure. Uh, well, when we, when we met with this lady, and that was the day that she, at that moment in time, she wanted to break away from her lifestyle in polygamy. She wanted to break away from uh, the whole thing. She was so scared. She was, it reminded me, right, it reminded me of when I uh, have been at, say, a, uh, a shelter for animals, say. Not, not trying to say okay, she's an animal. I'm just saying this, an animal who had been maybe abused or, you know, left, you know, un, uncared for. Mm -hmm. And it's just, just sitting there like a small little animal. I remember this one dog I remember seeing just shivering and just shook, just, you know, mm -hmm. just um, so so out of touch with what we would say would be a healthy, you know, mm -hmm. loving kind of a pet for your family, you know. Yeah. But this woman was very sweet, very nice, very um, very just nervous and and just ready to, uh, she, she thought that there were gonna be snipers yeah. Um, surrounding us, mm -hmm. uh, people tracking her down. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is this is just recently in the last you know six months or so. Yeah, and she um, she she was genuinely frightened. She mm -hmm. was a very frightened woman. Okay, we have a couple of calls here. Let's take them. Um, we have Fred calling from Salt Lake City. Hello, Fred. Hello, Fred. Yes, Elizabeth Doris. Yes, Fred. Are you on the air? Oh, okay. Um, I think that Sean McCraney is a musty clam and that you are too. Oh, is that right? A musty clam? Well, well I, you know, whatever. <laughs> Okie dokie. Well, let's see if Michael from Provo can have something better to say. Hello, Michael. Hi, Doris. How are you? I'm just fine, thank you. Okay, Doris. Uh, now, my question. No, I don't. I don't want to be rude or anything like that, other brother. I'm a member of the LDS Church, and I just have. I mean, uh, a few questions. I. Uh, the LDS Church doesn't get on a TV program and talk about how false other churches are, and and with the same respect, and and, and honestly, I don't want to cause any contention, but it's just. You use these books like this, um, paths, Diverted Paths of the Restoration, and other sources that you use, and testimonials, but what makes that any different than Joseph Smith, who said that he knew and he saw? How does that make you different with you trying to prove it logistically and with sources of people who have, you know, studied for years? How does that make what you say more true than what Joseph Smith said when there are 13 million people around the world who say that they believe what Joseph Smith said because God told them. Do you want to answer that? Well, I would just say, uh, Michael, uh, thank you for calling in tonight. And um, just remember, too, that if, if we were to travel by plane to the country of India, we'd find 850 million people that, that worship a monkey god. Okay, so uh, using a number of 13 million people doesn't impress me um, as to whether or not something is true or false. Would you agree with that? Well, first, I wouldn't call it a monkey god. I mean, it's something that they believe with their heart. And although my beliefs are different, I wouldn't set up a TV show to make fun of what you call a monkey god. Oh, well, I see. See, I've, I've been to the town of Palakalu in India just a couple of years ago, and I have a picture of the monkey god that they do worship. So that's why I'm not making fun. I'm just using that as an actual reference. When I was in India, sharing the gospel with people there, uh, I'm trying to make the point, uh, Michael, that 13 million people, first of all, and... 18, 850 million people, that, that's really not, not the best place to go first as to whether or not something is true or false. Would, would you have to agree with that? Because that's just something I, I don't think 
we would, I think that's something we could both agree on is that we don't worship a monkey god or a river or things of, those nat- of that nature. There, 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 there's no truth found in the, the gods of Hinduism. Well, sure, sure, and, and, and I can understand and agree with that. Okay. My, my question is, I guess, how do these sources of books that have, that have been created by people who already don't believe something and are trying to prove... This, this was written by a Mormon. This was written by a Mormon attending the Brigham Young University. Uh, okay, I, I guess, I just, I don't understand... What are you trying to accomplish with this TV show? We, we are, Michael, we're trying to accomplish the fact that Joseph Smith established a religion that relies upon polygamy for salvation. And that is totally contrary to what the Bible teaches. But, but and he taught in the section 132 of the Doctrine and Covenants, which is followed today by most of the polygamy groups or by many of them, that if you don't practice polygamy, if you're a woman and you agree or you will not agree to do it, you will be destroyed, that you'll die, you'll go right straight to hell, and that you will not be able to go into heaven. We're here to witness to the truth, and the truth is that we're saved by grace, not by works, the works of polygamy or any other works that the Mormon church or any other church would bring out as a, as a means to salvation. That's why we're here. We're not making fun of anybody. We have not made fun of anybody tonight at all. We've talked about an experience that Russ's grandfather had. Sure, I understand. But Doris, yeah, that's in section 132. But 120 years ago, a successor, Wilford Woodruff to Joseph Smith, said that polygamy was over. But do you ever talk about that? Yes, we talked about it. We've talked about it several times. And and basically, God doesn't change. If polygamy is right, it's always right. It doesn't change. God's morality does not change, Michael. I'm sorry, but it does not change. Then why did Jacob have four wives in in the... God never told him to. Is there a place in the Bible where God told him to? Doris, I understand you. It might not say in the Bible God never told him to. But do you still hold Jacob as a prophet if he did this, what you call a wicked act of polygamy? Because he can't be a prophet and do wicked things. Uh, Do you know of a person that is absolutely perfect? Whether it's Jacob or Abraham or uh, even your prophet, are any of them perfect? And there are many prophets who have not been absolutely perfect, but their heart was for God. And if you want to read the story of Jacob, you're going to look that Jacob only chose one wife. The rest of them were thrust upon him. Of course, I I understand that no one is perfect. I'd be the first to tell you that. My, My concern is that if when we read in the Bible that prophets receive revelation almost daily from God, you would think God would have told Jacob, oh, and by the way, stop having four wives. But he didn't. Yes, he did. He was disobedient. <laughs> so was David. So was Abraham. But where does it say that, Doris, besides from your mouth and from the mouth of people who disobeyed? The, the Bible is clear that God wanted a one man, one woman marriage. And we've been doing some Bible studies on polygamy. No, um, that's what you've been doing, the studies. But, but God... It's a God who answers our prayers and who answers our questions. Yes, Michael, we need to test the spirits and make sure that we know who is answering our prayers. God will never answer a prayer that is contrary to his revealed will in the Bible. Never. And that's why we can say that Joseph Smith did not receive the revelation for polygamy. God is against it. He made it clear in the Bible. Therefore, he is never going to command it. Hey, Doris, I I guess I just... I know that you have a fire and a passion for these things, and that's wonderful, but I just feel like... The only thing that counts, Michael, is truth, and that's why we're here. Is it possible to mention, too, Michael, Michael, that um, in, in the LDS view of heaven, that it's possible for a man to have Brother, more than one, one wife? One moment before you say that, you will say the LDS view, yet you left the church, so... Well, I'm just, I'm just asking you, do, do you know that, I mean, I, I, anyone can read, anyone can study, right. you know, and, and so that's not hard to do. I just, I just wonder if you should ask your bishop if it's possible 
if, say, if you're a married man, if you want to become a god someday and, and enter the highest level of the celestial kingdom, will you have to accept uh, uh, another ceiling? Um, are you familiar with some of these things in the, in the post-mortal world and, and so on? I am, and it doesn't say anywhere. That's... If you open up the book Mormon Doctrine by Bruce McConkie, he was an apostle, and he was, if, he, if he truly was an apostle of Jesus Christ, he wrote that at the time of, this, of the millennium, if you look up the word plural marriage, I want to, I want, I want to encourage you to do that uh, before the week is out, and look under plural marriage, and you'll see that in, when it talks about the millennium, uh, that, that, G, that, that God will reinstate plural marriage again. Now, I don't agree with that, but that's, that's Mormon teaching from a, an apostle of, of the LDS Church. And if he does... And God wouldn't do that. But how do you know? Because... Because he's already stated in the Bible that he's against polygamy, because he's not going to go against his own will. And I've seen the pain that it's caused in my mother's life, in my six other aunts and uncles' lives, and I've seen the pain that it's caused in my grandmother's life. And, and, I, and I hope, deep down, you don't think that polygamy is something that you would ever want to practice yourself. I just don't. Well, good. I guess I, I, I just don't understand that when if polygamy ended 120 years ago, why you still use it as a crutch for the LDS Church when, I mean, when we think about, and I'm not saying other churches are wrong, but when we think about the Catholics and the wicked things that happen in the Catholic Church. Michael, we're not talking we, about the Catholic uh, the, Church. Michael, one minute here, please. Oh, may I, may I please? The Mormon Church teaches they're the only true church on the planet. That puts down every other church in existence. That, and that's their platform. That, that is our platform. That's okay, so then you've put down the Christian churches and the Catholic churches and all the other churches by saying you're the only true one. But are Catholic churches Christian churches? And is the We're not here to discuss the Catholic church. We're here to discuss polygamy and is it God's will or is it not God's will? Does salvation depend upon polygamy? The early Mormon church leaders said that if you did not practice polygamy, you were going to go to hell. And that came from Brigham Young and Wilfred Woodruff and John Taylor and Joseph Smith and all of them. God doesn't change his salvation plan. It either is or it isn't. Michael, will you ask your bishop this Sunday if, if uh, you have to enter into plural marriage in order to uh, go into the highest level of the celestial kingdom? No, uh, good brother. I'm sorry, I don't remember your name. And well, I Russ. will ask him, but I already know that God will never ask us to do something that we can't do, and that he doesn't expect of us. And I also know that Isaiah, Isaiah taught, he said, God's thoughts are not our thoughts. And so how... Well, that's not one of God's thoughts, I can tell you right now. Uh, the how, whole idea, he, he would not ask, he will not, he does not ask men to do that. That's a, that's a debauchery, that's, that's uh, pagan, that's, that's nothing even close to anything. So I just have to lovingly tell you, my friend, don't, don't, don't even think that way about God, because... Because don't, don't put God down to the level of, don't put Heavenly Father to the, to the level of a fleshly, lustful man who would think that it takes more than one wife to fulfill him. Okay, we've got, to, we've got to rush on here, Mike. We're getting towards the end of the time, and we have another call coming in, but we'd like to thank you for your call. Okay, Doris, but you didn't really listen, and I know that that usually happens I, on this. Excuse me, I have another call to take, and we're getting the old, and I did listen, Michael. Are you just... Are you, <laughs> thank you. Good night. Okay, we have John on line three. Hello, John. Yes. Yes, John from Salt Lake. We only have a couple of minutes, so I'll be okay, quick. Okay, uh, real quick. I just was listening to you with... Oh. Hello, did you turn down I was down listening your... to you uh, talk with uh, Michael about the one wife. We need to realize that uh, there was a revelation to have more than one wife to uh, uh, go to the, uh, the number one heaven. They never did have another revelation to stop polygamy. That's right, they didn't. They just well, they advised didn't. it. Another thing, if Apostle Paul spoke about, if you want any type of ministry, you're to have one wife. Okay, so it does speak about uh, only one wife. Oh, the Bible is full of, of exhortations uh, against polygamy. Yeah. yeah. As far as uh, Solomon and King David, hey, they were mere men that chose to sin against God and uh -huh. they paid the price for it. That's right. And, and we support you out here, Doris. Uh, <laughs> that's your name, right? Yes. And so uh, keep going, and uh, we're listening to you, and uh, we also are out here witnessing. 
And oh. people need to realize that uh, it's the doctrine of Mormonism. Right, it is. It's the doctrine. It, it isn't the people. Exactly. And it's the same with they polygamy. Need to that. I, I love the polygamy. I have people in polygamy groups. I love them very, very much. But it's their doctrine. It's a false salvation plan. That's correct. And that's all people need to know. And if they want to refuse to hear that, that's on them. That's, that's between right. Them and God. That's right. But we're doing what God told Ezekiel to do, right? Exactly. Speak out and tell them. Keep up the good work in uh, our God's work, and we're praying for you. And, uh, May God bless you guys. Thank you, John. Have a good night. Uh -huh. Thank you. Okay, well, we had what we were, clams? Clams at first? It Musty started. Clams. <laughs> yeah. Musty clams. <laughs> okay. Well, we're, we're towards the end of the show here, Russ. Um, I'd like to thank you for sharing uh, your experiences. And whichever order of Aaron it is your grandpa was in, at least we heard that this mm -hmm. other one isn't mm -hmm. practicing polygamy, of which we're grateful for Jane for calling and telling us. And to uh, closing comments, I'd like to say that uh, Jesus lived a perfect life. And uh, when in, whenever anyone would trust him for salvation, uh, the perfection of his life will be transferred to you. And so you won't have to live a perfect life. Jesus suffered for your sins so that when you trust him for salvation, you won't have to suffer for your own sins. Jesus died for you. He died on the cross. He died a miserable death. He died for you so that you won't have to die for your own sins if you trust in him for your salvation. The Bible says that the wages of sin is death. And Jesus died for you. Um, so you won't have to die for your own sins. And the death that that's talking about is eternal death in uh, eternal separation from God. There is no law that can save you. I know people say there's a higher law called the law of polygamy. There is no such higher law at all anywhere in the Bible. And even if there were, you cannot be saved by the law. The law has no grace attached to it. We are saved by grace through faith. And last week we talked about grace and we, we decided, we found that grace is receiving what we cannot earn, which is eternal life. It's receiving what we do not deserve and that is eternal life. And so we're saved by grace through faith not by works of any kind. So instead of relying upon polygamy for your salvation, turn to the Savior, Jesus Christ. He loves you. He died for you. And we do the show because He loves us all. See you next week. Good night. <laughs>